It's taken us three weeks, uh, all because you people are so hungry for the Word of God, and you've been pulling it out of me. Amen. So um, I'm very excited about that. Um, so but we're going to finish that tonight. So as we've already talked, there are uh, eight periods to the life of Christ, and um, we'll just get to that slide. And if you want to get in on this, you can also go look at our previous messages on uh, communitygospelnj.com, and we're also, we have them uh, posted there as well under video sermons. Uh, but this is a chart that just describes the life of Christ through the Gospels. There's eight different periods. So if you're confused, don't be. It's just three, three levels. You have on the top level, you have the period of the life of Christ. And then you have the middle level is which Gospels those periods are in. Because as you know, the Gospels are portraits. Not all the Gospels are the same. They're very similar, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called the Synoptic Gospels, which just means similar in form, uh, with John being very different. In fact, scholars have always uh, said, or the early Christian fathers have said, John is more of a spiritual Gospel. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very comparable because they share many of the same stories. But in John, you have a lot of different stories that uh, he puts. But God put them all together, gave us four Gospels so that we can get a complete picture of Christ. Um, so you'll find the different periods of Christ's life, eight different periods, and the different aspects of his life uh, where you will find that in Matthew or Luke or Mark or in all three or all four. Uh, and then you have his early life, which is, uh, I always find this amazing that when you study the life of Christ, you have 33 and a half years of ministry uh, or 33 and a half years on the earth. Uh, of his natural birth, you have 30 years of his life. It's like just in just a few chapters. Mm -hmm. And then you have the rest of the chapters of the Gospels, like 90% of the Gospels, it's just, it's, it's um, three and a half years. So it's like, it's amazing. You would think you, for something for 30 years, you would think it would take up 20 chapters. But no, 30 years of his life is spent in like two chapters of the Gospels. And then three and a half years of his life just this small fragment, I mean, which is nothing, right? Um, it's almost 90% of the Gospels, chapters 3 through 20, depending on which Gospel we're going to read for Matthew and uh, 16 for Mark and so on. But, um, so that's a little bit of a chart. So we have already worked through the early period of Christ's life. We've worked through his preparation for ministry. we worked through uh, his early ministry. Now we're going to go into the Galilean ministry, and we'll work through this to the end. So we'll have his Galilean ministry, and then his, uh, the training of the Twelve, the Judean ministry, the Korean ministry, and the last days of Jesus. Um, so we'll, we'll take a, a brief look at that. Um, you'll see that like in the Galilean ministry, it's mainly Matthew and Mark. That doesn't mean that Luke doesn't have it or John, but it's not as significant. So that's, that's the, the point here. The emphasis would be in Matthew and Mark's gospel. Same with the training of the Twelve. Uh, Matthew and Mark, the Judean ministry, Luke and John. It's not that it's not in the other Gospels, it's just not as prevalent or significant or as emphasized as these Gospels. So, um, but all the Gospels share something in common, which is his last days, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we'll pick up with the Galilean ministry. And my prayer is that this is life-changing to you, not just academic, which is always the challenge, but academics without application will go nowhere. It means nothing. We want this to be life-giving. We want this to be transformational to your life. So let's just take a quick peek at the Galilean ministry. And I'm just going to give it to you because our printer is still down. We don't know when uh, Kanika is going to be here to uh, fix that. Uh, it was supposed to be today, but they, they, there was a no-show. So uh, hopefully tomorrow at some point. Um, anyway, let's look at the selection of the disciples. And um, this is found in Matthew 4. Mark chapter 2, and like I said, there's some here in Luke 5 and, uh, and Luke chapter 6. In fact, Luke 6, I actually really like um, this version of it because it, it describes Jesus choosing his disciples, choosing the 12, the 12 disciples. And um, interestingly, when we get to Luke, and I like actually Luke's account of the notes, emphasized there in Matthew, Mark, you, it should be Luke up there actually as well. Um, but in Luke's account, it says this when he chose the 12 disciples that it came to pass in those days, Luke 6, 12, that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself and from them he chose 12 whom he also named apostles. And he proceeds to name them Simon whom he named Peter, Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, 
Matthew and Jay, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zealot, uh, the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. All of the apostles, with the exception of John the Apostle, uh, died as martyrs. They died, some of them died horrible deaths. I believe it was James, James who was uh, practically uh, speared uh, with arrows, and I think Bartholomew, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, flayed alive, skinned alive. And some of them uh, died horrible deaths. I mean, we saw on Sunday in the book of Revelation with Antipas, right? Uh, when he was at, at Pergamos. I mean, he was put into a, a basically a brass, a bronze bull, and they would light the fire under the bronze bull, and they could hear the screams of the person inside the bull, and they had these pipes in there that would echo out, and it would almost seem as if the bull was coming alive. That's how loud it was. And, um, and it was said of Antipas that when he was dying, that they could hear him praying for his church. And he was really uh, the bishop there of the churches, which is really remarkable to me of the grace of God, and how God's grace comforts us even in our, uh, in our pain, that we could be in the most severe pain, and yet God's grace is available. So but many of us don't tap into that grace because we, we don't believe for it. We don't, uh, you know, we, we just kind of, we just hope for it. We just, we, you know, we don't know if God, what God's going to do. And we just, we live on this idea that God will just, if he wants to do it, he'll do it. But let me tell you, when you're desperate, your faith will come alive. Let me tell you that. So we need desperate faith. We need to be, we need to have that. We need to learn how to cultivate that. Uh, and that's something I want to work on on a, on, on a regular basis. I remember uh, one of our DSOM instructors, uh, when he did his doctorate degree, I think he wrote a book called Crazy Faith. Crazy Faith. So uh, I think that's one of our instructors, and if they're watching, well, kudos. Uh, it's Dan Korea. That's his book. So I think you might even be able to pick that up on uh, Amazon, by the way. It's called Crazy Faith uh, by Dan Korea, uh, Dr. Dan Korea. So uh, very interesting. So anyway, getting back to our, our point here on uh, Jesus his selection of the disciples, what has always fascinated me about Jesus is he didn't just pick 12 disciples randomly. He prayed over this. He spent time in prayer, seeking the mind of God and discerning what the Lord was telling him. And if you look at verse 12, it says that he went out to a mountain to pray. That means he went alone. He didn't, he didn't go there with anybody else. And what I find fascinating is, it says, and he continued all night in prayer to God. Continued all night in prayer to God. That means he didn't sleep. He pulled an all-nighter. And we've done that here in the past, all-night prayer. Maybe we, should, we need to do some more, to be honest with you. Um, but I believe that he was waiting on God and listening for the direction of the Spirit to tell him who he was to choose as disciples. We don't know how many were there, but I believe that he prayed through different names. And as he would go through Simon, and he would pray, God would speak that one. Okay? And then he would go through. But it took him all night to go through, just, just to get 12. Who knows how many names he had to go through? And it went 50, 60, 70, 80, who knows? How many he had to go through. But God had 12 that he said, I want you to focus on these men, to train them, and then they will go out into all the world and preach the gospel. But when I think about it, continuing all night in prayer, friends, this is the Son of God. He is fully God. He is fully man. He's living as a prophet under the Abrahamic covenant. And you would think that being fully God, he could just know instantly who he's to choose. No. Because he had to come and live his life as an example for you and I. Hebrews said he had to become just like us. He had to experience what we experience. He had to experience tiredness, temptation, fatigue. He had to go through it. He had to pray just like you and I have to pray. He had to leave that example. Philippians chapter 2 says that he laid aside his divine privileges and took on him the form of a man. That's kenosis in Greek, he had, he, meaning he emptied himself of his deity, of his not deity, but of his divine privileges, meaning that while he was still God, he did not, he did not go around acting like God, you know, throwing thunderbolts out of his fingers, like, ksh, ksh. no, he had to be anointed by the Holy Spirit, who would go about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil. 
Remember what we looked at last week. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. We went through scripture after scripture from the Old Covenant, Isaiah 42.1, Isaiah 61, verse 1. And what we see is when the Spirit will come on him, then we see him empowered. And that is the beauty of it. And it's the same model for us today. Jesus said, wait for the promise of my Father to come, which is the Holy Spirit whom he's going to give the church. And when he comes, we will be empowered and we will be able to do the works that Jesus has done. And Jesus even said, and greater works than these you will do because I go to my Father. He who believes on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works. Why? Because I go to my Father. What's he going to do when he goes to the Father? He's going to send the promised Holy Spirit. And we have the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you need to receive the Holy Spirit. You need to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled even more than what you already are filled. And Paul said, be filled with the Spirit. And in the Greek, it's be filled or continue to be filled. Meaning that you don't just get filled one time. Yes, there is an initial filling, but then there is a filling and a refilling and a filling and a refilling and a filling and a refilling and a filling and a refilling. You're constantly being replenished. It's like the dead city. If you don't get refilled, you just, you, and you just take it all in, and you, you just sit there, and there's nothing for God to fill you more. So you got to, and then as you, but as you live, as you work, as you, as you do ministry, you give and you, you deplete that. You just, you give of those resources that are in you, and then you are empty, and then God refills you. But you have to cultivate your prayer life to be refilled, to be filled up with the Spirit. That's a teaching for another time. But I love this because I see this human side of him in this verse where he says he continued all night in prayer. What was he doing? He was trying to figure out, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? And when that evening was over, he had the mind of God because it says that he came down from that mountain and he chose 12. And those, and that was, and those 12 became his disciples. So my point to you is that whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever challenge you're up against, pray it through. Pray it through. You're not sure where to move? Don't move until you've prayed it through. You're not sure who to marry? Don't marry until you know in your heart that this is the one who I believe God is leading me to. If you're gonna take another job, Make sure you pray it through before you step out and take that job. Because you might take that job without praying it through and it may be your worst nightmare. And then you're going to blame God and say, why did you let this happen to me? And God said, well, you didn't wait on me. I was trying to get your attention, but you didn't even consider praying or asking. And it's like, oops. I mean, we've all been there. There's nothing to be ashamed about it. You get excited over something. You get excited about you know, oh, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to do, you know, oh, let's, 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 not, let's not jump to conclusions here. What did James say? He said, listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll do this or we'll do that. He says, all such talk is evil. He says, no, you should say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll do this, we'll do that. We'll go here, we'll go there. He says, but as it is, you boast and so forth and so on. And he says, all such boasting is evil. No, you should say, if it's the Lord's will. Well, how do I know what the Lord's will is? Pray. Get the mind of God. And sometimes you have to pray for long periods of time. Sometimes that answer may take months. It may take weeks. You look within. You pray, Lord, what are you saying about this situation? What do you want me to do? And get quiet and listen. You may have to come back and revisit it. And the Lord may start bringing up things in you. He may put people in your path speaking things to you, but pray it through. Get the mind of God. Get the counsel of God. If Jesus had to pray all night in prayer, what do you think you might need to do? You might have to go for weeks or months about one situation and pray that through. But I guarantee if you pray it through, you won't be sorry. More mistakes are made because people have not taken time to pray it through. More mistakes are made. Are, are made. Than not. Less th you'll make less mistakes if you will learn to pray through significant life altering decisions. I'm not saying you won't make mistakes because you're human, you're fallible. I am. You can miss it. You can think God told you something and, and it wasn't God at all. But you have to take time.
and you have to listen, and you have to, you have to, you know, cultivate that relationship with the Lord. I won't, I won't spend any more time on that. Let's, let's move forward. And the teachings of Jesus, uh, we move now into uh, his, his teaching. And of course, there's the Sermon on the Mount, the parables of the kingdom, discourses on uh, the, the Christ's equality with the Father. Uh, we see this in Matthew, and we see it in, in Mark, and, uh, and, and so on. But let me just say this to you about uh, Jesus' teachings. I was thinking about this because uh, one of the, the most notable things about Christ is that when he was alone with his disciples, he would teach them. But when he would go out to the masses, he would preach to them. There is a difference between preaching and teaching. <clears throat> With his inner circle, he would teach. And when he would go out to the masses, he would preach. Preaching is proclamation. Teaching is instruction. Teaching is application. Preaching is inspiration slash proclamation. It's, it's the proclaiming. You're not, it's not A, B, C, one, two, three. That's why when I'm here, I like to teach. I like to feed you the word of God and teach. But if I were to go out and minister abroad, and I'm going to minister to the masses, I'm praying for that preacher's anointing to come on me, to proclaim the word of God. I remember uh, T.L. Osborne many, many, many years ago when he was just uh, getting started in the ministry, before my time, of course, but I heard him tell this story that he went out, I think, I don't know which country, it was like a third world country, and uh, he was, he got there and he started to minister, and it just flopped. I mean, just flopped. And he was doing this for several nights, and it just was flopping. I mean, I don't know how he was measuring that, and maybe the crowds just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller, or, no, I think uh, there was no response. He was having these altar calls at the end of his message, and there was just no response. Nobody was doing anything. And the Lord showed him in the Word where it said, I didn't say go into all the world and just, you know, uh, you know, of course he said go and you know, teach all nations, but he directed him to Mark 16 to go into all the world and preach the gospel because it was evangelistic in nature. That's what he was trying to do. And he caught the revelation and he realized, Lord, I've been trying to teach these people and that's why it's not working. What I need to do is I need to shift here and I need to preach to them. And so he started to preach the next night he went out and he preached. He, pro he, was, he didn't try to instruct and say, okay, let me just show you how this works. He didn't do that. He just preached. He just proclaimed, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. And as he did that, he said the crowds responded like he had never seen before. And he said they had gr the, the greatest miracles that they had seen since they had gotten there. Wow. And it was, but you see the context. You see, your audience will determine your context. And so this particular audience that Jesus is speaking to, when he was alone with his disciples, he would instruct them. He would teach them. But then when he would preach to the masses, for the most part, there was more proclamation. It's not that he didn't teach the masses, but I'm just saying the, the nature. Uh, you know, there is a little bit of a, little bit of a difference. Um, but anyway, uh, then we come to the miracles of Christ in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, Mark chapter 1, and then also we can look at Luke 7 and even in John 4. And the miracles of Jesus really, obviously, God did them through him because he loved the people, but they also authenticated his person and message. They authenticated the fact that he was the Messiah. The miracles served to confirm his messianic claims. You understand that? He's the Messiah. And so God... When he does something, he confirms the word with signs following. He proved that this was from God through these miracles. In fact, when they didn't believe him, Jesus said, "Well, if you don't believe, he said, believe on you know, believe on the, uh, the you know, I'm trying to get it right uh, to believe on uh, me for or believe on the miracles for the sake of me, something to that effect." He was trying to point them to say, look, if you don't really believe, he's like, well, look at the miracles. They testify for themselves. They witness of me. So that's, you know, one, one thing to note about uh, the miracles of Christ. And, and, we've, and we've kind of, you, you've heard me talk about this. And uh, the miracles of Jesus are not limited to Jesus himself. When he was on earth, he performed miracles. But when he went, he gave that responsibility to the church. At 
of course, under his direction. In John 14, 12, he says, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And then he says, And whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So here's the here's a question I have for you: Is what determines whether or not miracles are performed through the church? What is it that causes miracles to happen? What is the what is the qualifier? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Faith. That's Faith. that's true. You exactly Faith. Faith. Because he said right here, he who believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Faith is the qualifier, the spirit is the doer. You're not the doer. Jesus didn't even, Jesus said, Jesus didn't even say he was the doer. <gasps> That's blasphemy, Pastor. <laughs> Jesus said, the Father within me, he doeth the works. You see? How is he doing it? Through the Spirit. And he's commissioned the church to be exactly that, to be, to be the one whom the Spirit flows through, where the arms of Jesus, the hands of Jesus, we extend ourselves out to the world. Jesus does the healing. The Spirit does the healing through the church. Jesus is the head. We are the physical body. He give, the head gives direction to the physical body. The church. The church is the body of Christ. We are the body, the body of Christ in the earth. We're a living, breathing organism in the world, in the earth. And Jesus is the head seated at the right hand of the Father. We're seated there with him positionally, because we're seated in heavenly places with Christ, but we're physically here on the earth. But our position is in heaven. We receive our direction from Jesus, but ultimately then through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit... Because the Holy Spirit then works through the church to do the works of Jesus. So like Jesus who said, the Father within me doeth the works, we too can say the Father within the church, the Father within us doeth the works, but he does it through us through the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So you can see the whole Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit working together as one. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds complicated, but just bottom line is you can do nothing apart from him. Amen. He's the, you know, you're the you're uh, the fruit that you know on the on the on the tree, so to speak. He's the right. I mean, that's what the Bible says. I am the vine; you are the branches. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. If you don't abide in me, you won't bear any fruit at all. So your source of strength, your source of help, your source for everything comes through the vine, Jesus. Mm -hmm. You're just the branch. If you cut yourself off from Christ, you're going to wither up. You're going to dry up at the roots. That's just the way it works. But we need that spiritual sustenance. We need the Holy Spirit to be working in us and through us. But faith is the qualifier. Faith is what gives access to the miracles. So if you can believe it, you can receive it. If you can believe it, it can happen. And that's why here it says, you know, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I mean, that's a, that's a big, I mean, it's right there, sandwiched right in there. <laughs> right in between the Holy Spirit and the, and the faith. Mm -hmm. He says, I mean, I, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you see literally three levels there. He who believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. So there's faith for miracles. And then he says, well, now if you ask him for anything. So you got to ask him. But ask in faith. And then the Holy Spirit comes next. Now I'll pray the Father, he'll give you the help. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who does it. So I have faith that God is going to do something. Well, that's not enough. You've got to release that faith. So when people say, well, I've got all the faith in the world, but I can't seem to touch God with my problem. Well, that's the problem. You're holding on to your faith. You better release it. How do I release it? Father, I'm asking you. Wow. You release faith. And then the Holy Spirit, he does his work. Do you remember Genesis chapter 1? The Holy Spirit says he was hovering over the waters. But he wasn't doing anything. He was waiting for God to speak. Mm -hmm. 
So the Holy Spirit acted when he heard the word. Let there be light. Or in the Hebrew, light be. And light was. Well, how did that happen? The Holy Spirit. I like to think of it this way with the triune Godhead. The Father orchestrated it. Jesus did it. And then the Holy Spirit manifested it. Something like that. That may not be 100% correct. But it's the Father's plan, the Father's orchestration. Jesus speaks it, light be! And then the Holy Spirit <laughs> causes it to come to pass. So it's the plan of God, the action of Jesus, and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I think that's it. I'm going to find out when I get up there. Because I'm not sure if the Father actually said it or did Jesus say it. Which one? But they're one, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but I want to find out. I want God to say, son, come here, let me show you something. And pull back that curtain. Remember you were asking about that? About how I did this? Let me show you. Let me, let me play, replay the videotape for you. Like, why not? You can replay it here. Why can't you do that there? I mean, I don't know what system they're using, but I'm sure it's high tech. I can assure you that. Anyway. All right, let's, let's move on. And then we come to the baptism of John, or John the Baptist, uh, his imprisonment. We see that in Matthew 11, Mark 6, and even in Luke chapter 3. And uh, this is really fascinating to me because John was Jesus' cousin, and he was jailed by Herod Antipas. And Jesus goes into Galilee, um, you know, which is basically, you know, and makes Capernaum his base of operations. Um, John, though, is in prison, and he's there for more than a year before he's executed, but during that time while he's in prison, he becomes confused and disillusioned. Um, and I think he becomes disillusioned because of his imprisonment. And in Matthew 11, he says this, and when John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? And then Jesus replies, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. And I, I love this because it's, here's this guy who has served and has labored, has been uh, serving the, the Father, he's been being prepared all these years, uh, Jesus comes along, he's the proclaimed Messiah, you know, the long-awaited Messiah. He's going to take away the sins of the world. They have, they have high hopes. The Messiah is going to come. Um, he's going to, this is their mindset, though. He's going to come, he's going to deliver us from the Romans. We're going to get out from underneath this bondage. And then all of a sudden, I'm imprisoned, and it's like, whoa, where's my liberation? And I'm about to be beheaded. And he becomes a little disillusioned. And he starts thinking, I don't know that Jesus, my cousin, is actually the one. Because he's not really doing what I think he should be doing. And, and that's when Jesus kind of, you know, when he found out about this, he sends disciples and says, listen, go back to John and tell John what you hear, what you see. You know, the lame walk, right? The dead are raised. In other words, this is really who the Messiah is really about. This is what he's all about. He's coming to bring life and liberty to the lost. He's coming to save the lost. He's coming to redeem humanity. He's coming to heal. He's coming to restore what the devil has robbed people of. He's coming to take back what the devil has done in the lives of people and restore them to their rightful position, to restore their relationship with God. This is what the Messiah is about. It's not about the Romans. It's not about liberation from Rome, so to speak. That's a physical liberation. Jesus is saying, I'm coming to bring a spiritual liberation, a spiritual victory, a spiritual freedom. And, of course, John is, is beheaded. But when I was looking at this, I, I kept thinking, you know, and, I, and I, just this question, have you ever felt, like John, have you ever felt disillusioned with the Lord? Did you have certain expectations of him, and then those expectations were not met? Because that's precisely what you have happened, what you have here. John has these expectations of who Jesus is, and then those expectations are not met, and he becomes somewhat disillusioned. 
And that's a question we have to ask ourselves. Have you ever found yourself in a place where you were disillusioned with Christ? Where maybe you asked him for some things and you were wondering why this didn't happen? Why didn't I get my healing? Why did my child die? Why did my, why did my spouse make it? Why did this happen? Why did that? And, it, 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 and those are legitimate questions. But I just would say to you, don't ever blame God for things you don't understand. Why? Because God never makes mistakes. Man makes mistakes. People make mistakes. We're flawed. God is not flawed. Just because we don't understand something of God or understand it the way, life, the way we think life should be doesn't mean that God is in the wrong. What it means is we don't know enough. What it means is we lack wisdom. We think God is supposed to operate in this way. I had, a, I had somebody come to me not too long ago to say they were upset with God because they were praying in faith for their healing and it didn't manifest. And they did everything I told them to do and it didn't work. And they were literally not mad at God, but they were on the verge of temp being tempted to be mad at God. And, that was, and they had to kind of catch themselves. And they admitted that to me. And I didn't really get to really give that counsel the way I wanted to, but I wanted to mention, do you know that there are a myriad of ways or multiple ways that God heals? Did you get the mind of God to pray that situation through? Because, first of all, did you even need healing? Could it have been resolved through a different means or a different method? You asked God to heal you, and it didn't happen. I said, but did you ever call the, for the elders of the church to come pray for you? No. Did you ever have somebody come lay hands on you? No, I just only asked God. Did you ever think about speaking to that mountain? Maybe you just Maybe the enemy's attacking you with a spirit of infirmity, and you don't need healing, you need that spirit to come off of you. Did you ever speak to the mountain? No, I only asked. Well, you, there, there you go. You, what you need to do is find, when you're not getting results, listen to me very carefully, when you're not getting results, when you're praying a certain way, and it's not happening, whatever it is, I don't care, healing, finances, it could be in any area. If you're not getting results, that's where you need to go back to the drawing board and say, God, I think I'm missing it here. And don't be ashamed to say that. Mm -hmm. I need you to reveal to me what you want me to do. What should I do? Remember what we were saying? You've got to pray things through. What does James say? If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously and without finding fault. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he who wavers is like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro. But let him ask of God. For what? Wisdom. Lord, I need wisdom in this situation. I found myself in a situation. I don't know what to do, Lord. For a long time, I just, I don't know how to handle this, but I began to pray it through, and pray it through, and pray it through, and then suddenly, it became clear. It took weeks for it to kind of crystallize. And I knew in my spirit, this is what God's wanting. Now, maybe in a situation with healing, it might be a little bit different. You know, it might be just go to the doctor or so on and so forth. I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything that goes on in, in people's lives. I don't know why some are healed, why some are not. I don't, I don't know. I, I have, I, I mean, I know we did a lesson here on 50, I forgot how many we had, but there was somewhere near, I think 25 or I think almost 25 reasons why somebody's, you know, prayers would be hindered. There are hindrances to prayer. You know that, right? There are. If you're bitter in your soul, it's not likely that your prayers are going to go very far. Mm -hmm. Just being honest with you. I remember Smith Wigglesworth was trying to minister to a man. A cripple. He was, he was lame in, in the bed. This is like in the early part of the 20th century, trying to minister to this man, and, and he was um, just bedridden. And he was praying for this man, and the Lord spoke to him and said that this, that, that 
what was hindering his healing was that this man was full of bitterness. And he said that, he, that, his, that, that his healing was being hindered because of it. And that if he would let it go, the Lord would, would, would be able to just raise him right up off of that. And he just wouldn't let it go. He just wouldn't let it go. And it was the, one of those things that it just, it was a hindrance. A hindrance to prayer. Anyway, I don't want to go into all the things, but what I'm trying to say is God is so much bigger than you and I. Just because something's not working doesn't mean that it's not true. You understand what I'm saying? Just because so-and-so didn't get healed or you didn't get healed doesn't mean that God doesn't heal. And so on. But I can tell you this. Faith is always a common denominator when it comes to healing. It is. So, anyway. Um, well, you know, we, we can do more, more, more teaching on that at another time. So, but I think, I think the common theme tonight that I keep hearing in my spirit is, folks, we need to seek God for answers. We need to seek Him for what He's telling us to do, what He wants us to do. And it's okay to take your time. Don't rush into major decisions. Take your time. Pray. I don't care what it is. It could be a financial decision. It could be a, a, a marriage. It could be a spousal. It could be, it could be, it could be healing. It could be sickness in your body. Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, remember King Asa? No, nobody remembers, right? <laughs> huh? What? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm only remembering it because it just popped in my head. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to bring all things to my remembrance, right? Now. I don't have this in my notes. But I believe that the Bible says that he got diseased in his feet. His feet were diseased. And the Bible says that he didn't consult the Lord. It says he consulted the doctors. And, and I think his condition worsened. and I think eventually he, he, he may have died. I, I don't have it before me. But the bottom line was this, is that Asa was depending on the arm of the flesh. And it says because he didn't seek the counsel of God, he didn't turn to the Lord for his healing, he sought the doctors instead. Now, you would say, oh, does that mean the doctors are bad? No, don't, don't misunderstand me. What that text is really saying is that Asa didn't even consider consulting God about what he was going through. He just went right to what he thought he should do. He didn't pray it through. He didn't think, he didn't say, Lord, let me, God, what do you want me to do? Let me go, let me go talk to the prophet or the priest. No, he just went right to the doctors. I'm not saying doctors are bad. I go to the doctors. But what I'm saying is that whatever you're facing, go to God first before you go anywhere else. Go to God first before you go to the counselor. Go to God first before you go to the doctor. I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. What I'm saying, what is, what is that story really telling you? It's telling you that you need to put God in his proper, give him his proper place. It's, we seek God first. And then we go, we do these things. But it's, it's, it's getting the mind of God, getting his counsel, figuring out, Lord, what are you saying? So anyway, let's move forward. Let, let's, let's, keep, uh, let's go to, to period five. Uh, this is the training of the 12. We're going to close in a few. I'm sorry I got started a little bit late. Um, I'm, I'm going to just kind of push through this. And this is where Jesus, he withdraws with his disciples. The Bible says um, in Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 5, Luke 9, John 6, and it says in Luke 5, 16, that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So why did Jesus do that? Why did he often withdraw to lonely places and prayed? It wasn't just to get the mind of God, my friends, to figure out what God was saying. It was, there was also another reason. Anybody want to take a stab at it? To get filled up with the Holy Spirit again. Mm -hmm. To build, yeah, that's yeah. To be built up with the Holy Spirit, to be re, to be replenished, mm -hmm. right? Because you have to be, you have to rest. You can't. You were not designed to go a hundred miles an hour all the time. Mm -hmm. You need rest. That's why God told Israel, it, "There's a Sabbath day." Mm -hmm. and in fact, the Bible says God rest. I always I always find that comical. I'm like God, you got to rest. <laughs> well, not really, <laughs> but it says He rested. He finished creating everything. He saw that it was good. Ah, and he said, I'm going to go right down to the Florida Keys. I'm just going to relax. Beautiful ocean view. He rested. Why has he 
yeah, why is he doing that? To leave you and I an example. Mm -hmm. So you have to deduce from that, if God has to rest, how much more do I have to rest? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a simple way of putting it. So you need rest. You weren't designed to operate on 100 miles an hour. I know pastors that they try to do it and they end up hospitalized. I know one pastor hospitalized several times for this very thing. Sorry, but you gotta rest, folks. All right, I wish we had more time, we can go into it. Then we get into lessons on discipleship, uh, Matthew 16, Mark 9, John 6. Uh, classic verse on discipleship is Mark 16. Uh, I'm gonna skip down to verse 24. Really, it's Mark 16, 21 through 26, but Focusing on verse 24, Jesus says, said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Uh, but the three verbs there in verse 24 is what you want to fo focus on. If any man will follow, come after me, he must what? Deny himself. And two, take up his cross. Take. And three, and follow me. Deny, take, and follow. Those are the three verbs for discipleship. You have to say no to your flesh. It's, 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 a, with, it's, a, it's a saying no. You pull them back, no, I'm not going to do this. But then there's something where the, the action verb is the going in the opposite direction. See, to deny is going backwards. No. But then he says, take up your, your cross. That means you've got to reach out and take up your cross. So on one side, there's a denial of no. But then on the other side, there's, there's a take. So there's a withdrawal, but there's also a take. Deny yourself. That's the no. But then there's a yes. Take up your cross. Take it. You're, you're reaching out. It's kind of like... To, it's, it's, I'm thinking of weightlifting, Gordon, you could relate to this, some of you can relate to it. It's the push and pull, so to speak. So, take up your cross. And we know that in that day, when you took up your cross, that meant you were pretty much going to your death. When the Romans made you carry your cross, you were, you were done for. <laughs> that was it. It was the worst form of execution. And Jesus says, and follow me. But that following him means carrying that cross around. Now, I'm not saying for you to go to Home Depot and construct a, a cross and we'll put it on your shoulders and follow Christ like this around the country. <laughs> That's not what it's saying. All right? But you, you, it's, it's a metaphor for, you know, saying no to yourself and doing what Jesus has, is wanting you to do even when you don't want to do it. Because, folks, we're on assignment here. You're on assignment. I'm on assignment. And that means that you can't just do what you want to do or live any way that you want to live. You're, we're, we're just sojourning through this earth, through this land. And thank God for His grace, but sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you gotta, you got to carry that cross. And it's not easy. And it's, it's be, you know, being a follower of Christ is hard work. It requires discipline. Hence the word discipline. Right? Disciple. Discipline. It means... You saying no to yourself when you want to say yes, when your flesh is screaming out, give me that. <laughs> and, you're, and, you're, and you have to say, no, Lord, I deny. And it hurts. Come on. We're all flesh and blood in here. There's things that you want, things that you desire, but you, you have to say no if it's going to interfere with your relationship with Christ. Anything that interferes with your fellowship, relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross. And I'll be selling crosses in the back after this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. I mean, I, you know, no offense. But I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, I went to ShopRite today. And I mean, I guess because I'm not, I'm not really religious. I guess, you know. But I'm, what, I'm looking at people and I see these black smudges on their foreheads. And I'm thinking... Did, did they get the mark of the beast? You know, I, now, folks, I haven't had my eyes checked in a while. I'm honest. I, gotta, I think I need glasses, to be honest with you. But I'm looking at these smudges, and I'm thinking, it's got to be the mark of the beast. I get closer, and they're crosses. I'm like, oh, forgive me, Lord, you know? It's Ash Wednesday. Duh, right? Duh. So, and I'm thinking, hmm, is that what it means to take up your cross? 
That's easy to do. Anybody can put a little ash and say, I got blessed and all that, maybe. But to take up your cross means when you want what you know you're not supposed to have and you say no to yourself because you want to honor Jesus and you love him more, that's what it means to take up your cross. And we're called as believers to take up our cross, especially when something's going to interfere with your relationship with Christ. If something's going to hinder that relationship, if there's something trying to get between you and Jesus, you gotta take up your cross, folks. Because if you don't, whatever's there before you is going to take the place of Christ who will try to take that place. So it's not easy, but guess what? His grace is available to those who will yield to it, those who will receive it. All right. Um, we've got, oh man, can I just have five minutes? Just yes. five minutes? Is that okay? Yes. All right. I know we're, 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 we're pressed for time. Uh, let's move to period six. This is the opposition of Jesus. And, you know, there was one thing here that I, I kind of have in my notes. This comes out of Luke 10, Luke 11, Luke 13, John 7, John 8. John 9, John 10, I'll be happy to share my notes with you if you want them, all right? Um, but there's this phrase from John chapter 7, verse 30, where it talks about how that they wanted to basically stone Jesus to death or kill him. But the Bible says that his hour had not come yet. His hour had not come yet. So they couldn't kill him. And this was six months before his crucifixion. And he went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacle, probably either September or October. And the opposition was steadily increasing. The Jewish leaders would have killed him, but as John has said, his hour, his hour had not yet come. Now, I'm going to just make a statement on this because I want to make this a little bit practical. When you're in the will of God for your life, when you're in the will of God for your life, the enemy cannot... Just come in and just destroy your life. He can't just bring in a tornado and just destroy you. When you're in the center of God's will for your life. Unless you being in the middle of God's will requires you to give up your life like, like being a martyr, for instance. Sometimes that does happen. God may call you to, to do something for him and it could cost you your life. Remember Jim Elliott? You know, reaching the unhappy, you know, the... Uh, Indians and so forth and the tribes, well, that was part of God's call for him, all right? Um, but I'm not necessarily referring to that, but I'm talking about when you are, when you're in the middle of God's call for your life, when you're in the middle of what he's called you to do, um, that is going to be where you're going to find your greatest blessing. You're going to find protection there. You're going to find your blessing there. You're going to find everything that God has planned for your life. Everything good, I should say, if you will. Even though I know, you know we're talking about taking up the cross. But I'm talking about, what I'm really trying to say here is this. Is that God has prearranged certain things for you to walk in in your life. To bless you. For you to experience in this life. There are things that God has for you. They, they couldn't just take Jesus' life. Because it wasn't his time yet. They couldn't just snuff it out. That was destined for a certain season called the cross, the crucifixion. He would experience that. But the season that he was in prior to that, they couldn't just destroy him and kill him. Because the Bible said his hour had not come yet. And it's true with you and I that you, if your hour has not come yet, the devil cannot just take you out. Even as a martyr, the devil can't just, you know, the people just can't just kill you if you're in the center of God's will and your hour has not come yet. He can't just take you. He can't just kill you or take you out if your hour has not come yet. Now, if your hour has come and it's time for you to go, that's a different ballgame. You, 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 you hear what I'm saying? And that's because what I'm trying to say is when you're in the will of God, in the center of God's will for your life, there is a blessing, there is a realm of protection in that. Until God says, okay, I'm now going to release you from that and I'm going to allow certain things to, to happen in your life. And that, and that is true for each and every one of us. Let me read this uh, 
Let me read this from Ephesians 2.10. The Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. That this means that God predestined us to walk in certain paths, certain things that he has for each and every one of us, that he has prepared for us. There are certain things. Let me read that from the Amplified. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew. Now watch this. That we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time. That we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. That there is a place that God has predestined, planned beforehand for you and I, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living what he calls the good life. That's when the exegete, that Greek, in that, that's what it's saying. It's, in other words, this is the perfect plan that God has for your life, that when you tap into the perfect will of God for your life, you will walk in a state of blessing because it's where he, he destined you to be. They could not touch Jesus until his hour had come. He walked in a perpetual state of blessing and protection until it was his time. And the same is true for you and I. But you have to take time to seek the will of God for what he has for your life. Each and every one of us has something here in this life that God has destined for you to do. And I, when I was studying this, the Lord spoke to my heart. And I wrote it down and it just, it, just, it, it just floored me. And this is what I heard the Lord say. Many don't experience God's will for their life because they don't take time to ask Him about it. There are many people who don't experience what God has for them because they have not taken the time to inquire of God about it. They have not taken the time to say, God, what do you have for my life? What do you want me to do with my life? And instead, what they have settled for is just mediocre living. They have settled for just the status quo. They figure that maybe God doesn't want to bother with them. Maybe they're so small. They're so insignificant. What does God care about my life? You know, he cares maybe more about the preacher than he does about me. Um, I'm the nobody. I don't, you know, who am I? And, you know, I go to work every day. I eat. I sleep. I get up. I do the same thing over and over. And this is my life. And this is all that I have. And many live that way. And God wants you to know, and I'm speaking this, I believe prophetically, that if you will take the time to seek Him and wait on Him and inquire of Him, of His will for your life, of what He wants for you to do, if you have never done that before, I'm suggesting to you and commissioning you to do that, to inquire of God. Even if you've worked your whole life in a certain area and you've worked in the same industry and you've done the same thing, but you've never really done that. Maybe you thought about doing that and asking, but you've never done that. God's will and call for your life remains the same. You might be doing something completely different today than what God has in mind for your life. But I want to tell you this right now, to each and every one of you right now, God has predestined you and he has planned beforehand for you to take paths which he prepared ahead of time. That's what the Greek is really saying in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And that you should walk in that. That you should discover that plan. But you'll never discover it unless you take the time to pray and inquire about it. You have no idea, some of you, watching by Facebook, listening in this room, God could have a call in your life to be a missionary. Oh, but pastor, I'm a little old. Well, so is Moses. How many 80-year-old men do you know getting commissioned into the, into the wilderness? He was. 
I don't care how old you are, because the call of God and the will of God has nothing to do with age. It has to do with calling. God has things for you that you have not even inquired, have inquired about Him, and you have no idea. When are you going to inquire of what God has for your life? And stop settling for status quo. I don't know where all that came from. Let's Holy move on. Spirit. Mm -hmm. We're going to close here. Period 7, period 8. The Perean ministry, that's period 7. And Perean, by the way, was a little bit, it was uh, east of Judea. It was on the other side of the Jordan. And Jesus spent about three to four months there before his crucifixion. Right over on the other <laughs> side of the Jordan River. Because Watch this. You have Galilee, right, in the north. Capernaum, where is his home ministry? Then you take that, you, you take that Jordan all the way down. You hit, and then you hit down by there's like the Dead Sea and all of that, all the way down there. But right before that, you have Judea, right? You have Jerusalem, Judea. But right on this other side is going to be actually, yeah, I'm depending on which side I'm looking at it. So if I'm looking at Galilee here, and then all the way down to Judea over here, Galilee in the north. Right, Jesus is crucified down here in Jerusalem, but Galilee was, let's say, in Capernaum, his home base town. The Jordan River goes all the way down, right, to the Dead Sea down here. But right over here, you have Jerusalem. If you go right to to the uh, to the east, you're going to find Perea. That's the region of Perea. And Jesus spent about four months there. And some of his most notable miracles were there. Luke 17, Luke 18, John 11. You have the healing of the ten lepers. You have the healing of blind Bartimaeus. Um, you have the raising of Lazarus, actually, uh, which scholars believe may have been the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, because when they saw that Jesus healed this man, they were like furious because all the people that saw it were following after Jesus. They were flocking to him. And, and the Bible says that the chief priest in John 12, verse 10, says that the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. That's what the text says. It says that they were going to kill him, kill Lazarus as well. Who is the other as well? Jesus. They were going to kill him. Um, up, up on you know on account of him, you know and anyway because many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. And then you have more notable miracles in Luke 13. You got parables. You got the the lost sheep, the parable of the prodigal son, the unjust steward, the unrighteous judge, teaching on discipleship, the kingdom of God, teaching on his upcoming death and resurrection. What was Jesus doing in those last three to four months before his crucifixion? Listen to me somewhere. I'm going with this. What was he doing? All of this. He was pouring out. He was pouring out every. He was pouring out his ministry to the very end. Reminds me of what Paul says that he's being poured out like a drink offering. And this is what I want to say about that. Don't abort your assignment until you have completed everything God has asked you to do. Many a preacher has gone, gotten out of the will of God because they aborted their assignment prematurely. Stay where God has placed you until it's time for you to move. If the cloud doesn't move, then you don't move. Stay where you're at and pour yourself out in that place. If God has called you to this church, then you give your best to this place. You pour yourself out in this place. Don't be a halfway Christian. Give God your best until he tells you, I have something more for you. I have this for you. And of course, pray about those things. Find out. I mean, I think the theme that we keep hearing over and over tonight is pray through, get the mind of God, wait on God until He tells you what to do. Don't move until He tells you what to do. Inquire of His will for your life, what He has for you. You're a young man. God has plans for your life. You have no idea what He has for you. You have no, no idea. And you seek Him, and, you, and He will reveal it to you, saith the Lord. I believe that. I believe that's, that's from the Lord. And that, and that goes for, you know, for all of us. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how far you have come in life and how established you've come. You gotta, you, you know, some of you need to hit the reset button. Some of you gotta, you gotta, you gotta just say, wait a minute, Lord. I need to do some praying and some fasting and I need to get alone and I need to go up into that mountain and I need to pray until I get some answers because my life is miserable. And I believe that that's for somebody in here. I do. And, um, but I don't know who, and I'm, I'm just, or watching. So I don't, I'm on a roll tonight. I don't know how I got off on all this stuff. 
All right. Last days of Jesus. Death and resurrection. This is it. We're done. I got like this much, and I promise we're done. Uh, death and resurrection. You know, this much could be like, right? Death and resurrection. Watch this. This is really, this is just an observation. I'm, I'm really done. 25% of the gospels, the gospel records, 25% of the gospel records deal with the final eight days of Jesus' death. 25%. One quarter of the gospel records <coughs> deal with the final eight days of Christ's death. His opposition during Passover week, the Upper Room Discord, the Olivet Discourse, that's the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world, the Garden of Gethsemane, a prayer, him being arrested, tried, crucified, all 25. It's about 25% of, of the gospel records cover eight days, eight days of, of his death or leading up to his death and so on. And then, of course, you know, we have we have them at the cross and so on. Anyway, so that's it for tonight, folks. Let me just pray for you and just bless you and just ask that the Lord will take what we've heard here tonight and just make it real to us. Did you get anything out of this? Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Father, we just thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor and give you praise. We just pray, Lord, what we have heard here tonight, Lord, that you will make this real to us, God. Make it real, God, and Lord, bring back to our remembrance and follow those areas that we've heard tonight that speak to us, that have spoken to us. Help us to put it into action, God. Give us the will to obey your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Amen. folks, we'll see you on Sunday. We're going to continue uh, with the book of Revelation. We're going to get to the church of Thyatira, and you don't want to miss that. Oh, wait, we got uh, tables. we got to put tables. Tables, tables. Finish.